back to the culture call on Praise 93.3 with L. Spencer Smith. Our desire is to reach and empower the community by discussing a cross section of relevant topics from various perspectives that are essential to its growth and interpersonal connections. Be sure to save our call in number 205 752 4800. Be sure to install the free Praise 93.3 app so you can send L. Spencer Smith a message or topic idea. Search for WTSK in your app store. This is the world premiere. Great morning, great morning, great morning, precious people. You know what time it is. Welcome to the Culture Call with Nelson Spencer Smith right here on Praise 93.3 FM. It is indeed the place where Tuscaloosa meets the world. You better believe it. Listen, and for the next two hours from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., I'm going to be right here having empowering conversations, talking about everything from society to sports, education to economics, from religion to relationships. We are here, yeah, every morning to create a safe space. That's right, a safe space to have empowering, provocative, and sometimes what? Controversial conversations. And guess what? You can call in or you can chat it up on the app. Yeah. And be a part of the conversation as we learn together right here on the Culture Call. Listen, as I do every morning, I want to encourage you, you and most certainly you, to go to your uh, your cell phone, go to your smart device and download our free 99 app. Yeah, Praise 93.3 FM. Absolutely. Download that app. And you can hear us and listen to us, chat it up with us from all around the world. Absolutely. No matter where you are. If you're in Topeka, Kansas, if you are in Jackson, Mississippi, or whether you are right here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that's right. You can hear us all around the country, all around the world. That's right. We're going global. We're getting better and better every day. So make sure that you download that app. Also, I have to remind you, go ahead and email me your public service announcements, your events, your whatever's going on in your neck of the woods, because guess what we can do? We can be your own, uh, your personal public service announcer. <laughs> That's right. I can be your marketer right here on Praise 93.3 for free. Mm-hmm. Just uh, email me me at culturecall.praise at gmail.com. That's culturecall.praise at gmail.com and give me an opportunity to let Lottie, Dottie, Sadi, Potty, everybody know exactly what's going on at your church, your organization, your fraternity, sorority. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. I want to let people know what's going on so we can create traffic. We can get some uh, some feet in the building. Yeah, so we can pack it out so everybody will know about the great things that you're doing. You know why? Because we do it better when we do it together. And as I say, of course, go ahead and write this number now, down, 205-752-4800, 205-752-4800, and you can call into the show. Yes, you can, or you can download that app. Once you've done that, you can go to the chat section and send me right here at the Culture Call a chat. You can tell me how you, how you like the show. Tell me your ideas, your questions. You can tell me if I'm stinking up the joint. It doesn't even matter. I just want you to contact us and be a part of the show. That's right. I want to hear from you. Listen, we've got an amazing day planned. And so, hey, here's what I need you to do. Sit back a little bit and relax. Grab you some coffee. You know what we like over here, Maxwell House or Starbucks. Y'all know what my favorite drink is. That's what it is, Carmel Macchiato. Or you can get you some herbal tea, some chamomile, calm yourself down if you've been working all night and you need something to help you go to sleep and rest and relax, yeah. Or you can get some green tea, green tea, excuse me, with that extra little caffeine kick. That's right. And wake yourself up if you've got some place to go or you're already there and you're kind of sleepy and drowsy and you don't like coffee. Green tea is a green tea. Why am I saying tea? Right. <laughs> green tea is a healthy, healthy alternative. Uh, yeah. Or you can go ahead and get you some alkaline water. Yeah. And it has alkaline on the bottle. That's right. Uh, you know, essential, whatever kind of water, get that and wake up those cells. Get down there and make sure that that body is detoxified and you're ready to go, raring to go. And let's get into the culture. Man, 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 man. Y'all, there's so much going on in these current event streets. And I hope y'all are paying attention. <laughs> I really, really do. You know, I think the world is already uh, uh, overwhelmed. 
about still overwhelmed rather about that Montgomery uh, boat brawl. I mean, it's, it, it has been hilarious. I mean, if you're on social media and I don't know if you are, but if you are not, do yourself a favor and go see some of these white chairs, go see some of these commentaries, these memes. It just has been hilarious. And I tell you so much going on. Of course, you know, not, uh, they're so uh, uh, in government and politics. We still have the former president. We still have so much going on. Listen, they're trying to push this this Prager University. If you're paying attention out of Florida, they're trying to push this ridiculous, uh, a historical curriculum that, you know, that reframes the whole idea of slavery. Now, I just want to push pause right here because that's not what I come to talk about in essence today. But I want to use this as a springboard. OK. All right. See, I want you to understand whose history they're trying to change. I, I want I want you to understand that they're not trying to change the Holocaust. They're not trying to change, you know, Japanese internment. They are trying to change the narrative of slavery. And you've got to stop and ask why. And not only that, comma, they're getting chocolate people to do it as well. They're getting these conservative African-American people who are not educated in the areas of African-American studies and history. And they're changing. You know, they had a uh, they showed a cartoon of Christopher Columbus as if he discovered America. Now, it is a historical fact that we know that Christopher Columbus did not come to these here, you know, United States. It did, did not come to America. That's not what he discovered, right? But his thing was talking to these kids who were coming from the future, you know, well, it's better to be a slave than it is to die or to be killed. What? What? And that's what they're trying to teach their children. There's so much concern about what one side is doing in terms of the liberal and left side is doing that they're going to swing the pendulum into a full-blown lie. And not only is it a lie, it's insulting to hundreds of thousands of millions of black people in this country to say it was better to be a slave than to die. When we automatically know that one of the mainstay uh, mainstay uh, sayings and quotes, what is, is better to, you know, our ancestors says, better be thrown off the boat as they were going through the transatlantic slave trade than to go into another country to be a slave. So in essence, they said it was better to die than to be your slave. So, yeah, it's all his, a historical. And you start have to start asking the question, why? Why are they doing that? Why are they disenfranchising the black vote? Why are they going through all of these great lifts and all of these great measures to make it seem like that our contributions to this country were not given by force? That we just somehow just said, oh, well, put us in slavery, put us in chattel slavery. And don't believe the lie and the myth and say, well, Africans did that. No, chattel slavery in the way that it was done, abusive and vicious and harsh, is an American construct. It is American. It is an American context. That it, absolutely, chattel slavery is an American construct. It is something that happened over here, right? And they're trying hard and desperately to reindoctrinate their children from the lie, right? From the lie. From the lie. Try it again. From the lie that. Uh, 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 you know, that's, that slavery was something that was beneficial to us. Y'all don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Preacher man, don't you get up there preaching and you know, I can see their point. I can't see their point at all. I cannot see their point at all. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, yeah, I can't, no, don't even, don't try to philosophize it. Don't try to theolo the theologize it either. Don't try to put God in it. No, no, no. They are twisted. It is perverted. It is his historical. It is not well studied. It has an agenda. It's a political agenda. It's an ideological agenda. And they're trying to, 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 to make us all one to dilute the potency of who we are. They are trying not to be accountable for the history of this country that still affects us today. Try it one more time. Yeah, don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't, mm -mm, don't, 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 no, I, I can't go for it.
I cannot. I cannot. There's so much more I could say on that, but I want to get on task about what I'm talking about today because we're still talking about accountability from yesterday. We still talk about that same subject from yesterday, accountability. And I need you to turn your radio up just a little bit this morning. That, that's what I need you to do. I need you to turn your radio up just a little bit so the saints and different ones can hear us. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, uh, yeah. I can't, I, I, yeah, I, I better stay on my task. Because accountability is what it has, all of this stuff, Trump, uh, Montgomery Boat Brawl, I told you yesterday, this whole idea of changing of the curriculum, you know, even to Carly, the young lady that lied about being kidnapped, it's all rooted in accountability, right? And this morning, we're going to talk about accountability and how when we move in accountability, it will help us develop healthy relationships. See, because here's what I understand. And let me use this this as a centering moment really quickly. One of the things that we're dealing with in this culture and in this generation is that people do not want to be held accountable. As a matter of fact, accountability is anathema. It's a cuss word to a lot of people. It's profanity. When people are held accountable, you say that you're, they say that you're judging them and you're doing X, Y, Z. And you can, first of all, let me push pause right here because there is a character to accountability. You don't have to be nasty. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be violent to hold people accountable, right? But, but, but you do have to tell the truth. And accountability is being attacked in our country and even in our community because of this one word. Well, here it is. This one cancerous viral word and that is entitlement that people feel entitled for to have something that they don't work for yeah yeah so 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 people people don't understand that if they do something that they should get consequences and not only that they don't understand that their actions are the the force that create other things to come to them In other words, that they are responsible for their actions and making sure that as they put a seed in the ground, that that seed comes back to them. They feel entitled. When they show up, they believe that everybody should cater to them, cater to their wants, cater to their needs, cater to their perspectives, cater to the way that they see the world. And that's not so. Accountability says that, yes, I am, I have the courage of my own convictions that I am accountable to what I believe and what I think is so, right? And watch this. I'm going to live it out until something of a higher or a deeper persuasion changes me. But watch this. Accountability all also says that I cannot force or make or feel entitled to other people to support my idea of what I think is important and or valuable to me. See, so, so, so you, you see how that works, culture call? See, many people now, it, 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 especially in the area of relationships, is what can you do for me? You know, way back in the 80s, I know y'all don't remember this because y'all say sanctify, filled the Holy Ghost, and you ain't never done nothing wrong in your life, and you ain't never listened to R&B music, whatever. Get over yourself, right? But those of us who did, all right, I know you grew up and cut your teeth on the consolers and all that. I get it. Shirley Caesar, James Cleveland, Hawkins, I got it. But that was a song that Janet Jackson, yeah, Michael's little sister, did back in the uh, the 80s. And it says, the song is entitled, What Have You Done For Me Lately? Right? And, and if you listen to that song, she goes through a litany of things that her boyfriend or fiance used to do or whatever her relationship used to do for her that they no longer do anymore as she was basing her love and her actions on what he had done for her lately right and 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 here is it here's what she says i never asked for more than i deserve right well wait a minute what qualifies that who says you deserve that who 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 says who says that what you think you're deserving of I am accountable to providing, right? And so it has created, and I'm not saying that song, but it's that mentality that has really, you know, uh, uh, you know, really been metastasized, has grown in this generation. As we listen to social media, as we listen to, you know, people, they, they want to know what you're going to do for them. When you begin to ask them what are they bringing to the table, right? 
when you begin to ask them what's going on with them and, and X, Y, Z, or, you know, what, what, what fashion on what principles are they going to bring to the table to make the relationship better? They don't want to talk about that. They want to know before I let, before I give you anything, what are you going to do for me? And that is the wrong context of relationships. That's definitely divorced from the understanding of accountability. See, accountability is you taking ownership of your actions, of your agency, of your your responses and your your framework of how you treat other people, right? That when you come into a room, it's not what can this room do for me? It is what do I bring to the room? What am I obligated and responsible for in inputting into the room? When you get into a relationship, it's not you asking him what, how, how many bills he's going to pay or do you have to pay any bills? It's not that. It's not you telling her, you know, uh, can you cook and all this kind of stuff, X, Y, Z. And I'm not talking about in terms of information or what they can do, but I'm talking about uh, and feeling entitled that that's what they ought to do. That's what they should do because in your mind, you feel like you are who you think you are. I get it. Ain't mad about it. Be who you are. But what you cannot do is that you cannot superimpose that level of entitlement and your will on others to make them think that they have to be obligated to give you something before you even think about giving them anything. See, and that, that's something key and critical. And that's everywhere, not just in, you know, uh, uh, intimate relationships, not just, but it's in friendships, it's in employment, it's at church. It has crept in to every sector of society, every sector of society, right? That people believe that they are entitled to support, that they are entitled uh, to good things, that they are entitled for you to give them your best, that they are entitled for you to pay their beers, bills, and you are entitled to get up out your sleep and talk all night to them when they have a problem, that they are entitled to all of that. And that entitlement kind of context that people live in is literally, literally culture called killing relationships, killing relationships that that there are there are parents that have children and make the children feel it, uh, obligated to take care of them. Right. Which, again, the book says that's that's absolutely wrong. That is that the, the parents should not ask that from the child. The parents shouldn't be taking, shouldn't be asking the child to take care of them. The parents should be taking care of the child. Hello. Right. And, and so, but they feel entitled. They feel entitled. Well, I brought you here and I sent you to school. And so now I need you to, yeah, I know you married and got kids, but I need you to take care of my house too. Do you know that there are people that have that level of entitlement? Do you know that there are people that are that level of twisted in their minds to think that they are entitled to raise children and have those children when they get up on their feet, not to move them out, not to push them forward in their own lives, not to help them establish their own family. But I, I sent you to, you got to college and all this other kind of stuff. And now you're supposed to take care of me. What? Really? Where did it get that from? Where does that, where does that sense of entitlement and entitlement is slitting literally the throat of accountability. Because when you begin to put that back on them and what have you done or what are you going to do, that like, you know, that there's always this what aboutism. There's this both sides ism. Right? Can I tell you the truth? That when you're in a real relationship, when you're in something that is transactional, that there are going to be days where you do things and that person cannot give you anything back. That person, but, but, but you don't feel, you don't feel they don't require it. It's like, it's like the man sitting on the side of the street and he's homeless, doesn't have any money and he's shaking his cup and you put a $5 bill in his cup. Then he said, man, you can't give me more than that. Wait a minute, bro. You ain't have nothing in your cup or oh, unless you lying. Unless you're lying about your indigence, you're lying about your, your, the position that you are in life right now. You got to be lying because a person that was truly grateful, was truly down on their luck, was truly homeless and didn't have anything, anything in the cup that somebody felt like they should give you because he that lends to the poor lends to, lends to God. So I put $5 in your cup because I don't believe I'm just giving you money, but I'm lending to God and you come back to me and say, this ain't enough. 
man, I can't even get a happy meal. Well, you didn't, you didn't have nothing. <laughs> you, you didn't have anything. You said, what do you mean? You see, it's this sense of entitlement. I mean, even in poor, people say, well, you know, it, they make it seem like rich people or wealthy people are mean and poor people are, are nice. Absolutely not. Ha- you know, those who are uh, physically disabled, are nicer than people who are well able? No, because I have met some entitled, nasty, physically challenged people. Nasty. In wheelchairs, nasty. On crutches, nasty. Nasty. Because they have this sense of entitlement. Right? And entitlement, I want to say this again, entitlement in relationships, entitlement in relationships is the death nail of accountability. Because the up the, 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 what God holds us accountable to and what you should hold yourself accountable to is what do I bring to the table? How am I going to make them different? You see, on Sunday I was up preaching in church and we were talking about the culture of growth and maturity. And uh, I wasn't getting any amens. I mean, I, I was doing my good old teaching. I mean, I was doing the thing, y'all. I had my notes all laid out. I, you know, I used my... My, 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 my college brain, my academic brain, I was talking about, you know, growth theories, uh, from, from educational psychologist Jean Piaget. I was talking about Eric Erickson and just talking about the differences and all that. Man, I had my, I had my lesson together. I had my theology together. I had it all together. And this, it was like crickets in the room. A, a, a sporadic amen and everything, <laughs> you know, came out every now and then. And I stopped and said, what is going on? This is not the church. This is not the Impact Nation. What's going on? What's wrong? Why are y'all quiet today? <laughs> what is going on? And then Holy Spirit said to me simply this, and I don't want to turn this into a preaching moment, but Holy Spirit said to me, it's, it's working. Keep talking. I'm working on something. They can't say amen right now. I said, oh, and I stopped literally in the mess, in the middle of the message I got out of my black preacher preachment kind of modality. I got out of that. I said, okay, I see what's going on now. Let me continue to teach. Let me keep going forward. Let me just go ahead. Yeah. Because guess what? I have to be accountable, number one, to God, accountable to the Holy Spirit who called me, and accountable to the people who I'm feeding, right? Right? And I wanted them to respond in a certain way when it wasn't that moment. But guess what? Guess what? I had to be accountable to continue what I what was given to me for them, no matter what they were giving back to me. No, I felt like a guest speaker that the church didn't know that they invited to make <laughs> the speaker to come. Right. Right. But I had to push through and do what I was accountable to do as pastor. Absolutely. And see, sometimes people are not going to always give you back what you give to them. And the requirement for me doing what I do was not, I didn't start to miss that. Listen, I ain't going to teach this. I'm going to stop. I'm going to sit down. We can all go to brunch if y'all ain't going to say amen. No, absolutely not. That's entitlement because I'm not entitled to their amen. No, no, no. I'm not entitled to their amen. Number one, because it ain't my word. It ain't my thing. I'm, I'm, I am just a mailman. So they ain't got to amen me. And, and I don't have to require that they amen God. Listen, because people go people. You see what I'm saying? But I have a, I am accountable to an obligation that I have to feed and lead them to the best that God has given me the ability. See, so, too many people have this whole idea. Yeah, listen now. They have this whole idea that people have to give back to them. You know, people, when they give something that people got to give back to them right then and there. Or where they sow. And I told you, the text says, is here you will reap what you sow, but not necessarily where you sow it. And reaping, if we're looking at just time and horticulture, if we're just looking at nature, reaping is not immediate. As a matter of fact, when you sow the seed in the ground, there is a season where you have to, where it's undercover. It's a season where you can't see it. It's a season where that seed goes in the dark. And there was something being developed in the dark. And that's the thing that when you begin to be accountable to giving get, uh, to yourself, to others, and you give in relationship, sometimes that seed is not going to be, you know, it's not going to come back apparently to you. You know, I was on social media this morning and I said to them, you know, there's a season when my children were babies. I did all of the giving. They couldn't give anything to me. Right. They could not. They were not in a position. Try it one more time. 
They were not in a position to give to me. And yet, those little rascals were entitled. <laughs> yes, they were. Because entitlement, watch this, y'all. Y'all ready? Because I'm getting ready to take a, a, a swift turn to the left. Y'all ready? Entitlement is symbolic or emblematic of children, of the immature. Yeah, I said it. And I'll say it again a little louder for those in the back. That entitlement is a is a is a sim, symptom. I don't want to even say sim, symptom, but that's the best word I can use right now. Entitlement is allotted to the immature, to the child. They were entitled to milk. They were entitled to baby food because they couldn't get it for themselves. They weren't responsible for being there, right? It was my wife's and I responsibility that they're even in the earth. And of course, God, I get all of that. He provided and we had to feed, but they could give us nothing back. Yet we were accountable to them, accountable to them, right? And the return was the joy in seeing them grow from the actions that my wife and I put into them, their father and their mother. That is the return that I, that, that when they started growing up and they could do for themselves, I helped them get there. Now, when they get five, six, and seven years old, should I go back and say, well, now, you know, <laughs> for all of that, you know, should I sing Shirley Caesar's song for the nine months I carry you growing inside of me, no charge, right? <laughs> you mean, you know, should I go back and do that? Should I tell them, listen, for that day, you, you, you know, you spit up some milk on my soup and, and I didn't have no towel and I had to wipe it off right before I preach. I'm going to need you to clean, to, 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 you know, to clean my, my suits forever. No. No, I am accountable to them. It is what I should have done. See, sometimes the roles that we select in life obligate us to doing things. Yes, we must be accountable for the things that we are called to do, that we are assigned to do. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next segment. It's called deontology. It's the study, deontology. That's right. That's a word. D E O N. T-O-L-O-G-Y, deontology. It is the study of obligation and responsibility, right? Yeah, and we, we're going to talk a little bit about that at the top of the next segment because I want you to understand all of us have to be accountable to what we have been created to do. And you cannot say, if I get in the midst of people that don't return to me, if I get in the midst of people that don't, you know, that don't give me what I need before I perform, before I can do anything, I need them to do this. I need them to do that. I need them to do that. No, 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 no. Deontology says I'm going to do what I ought to do. I'm accountable to my oughtness, right? And where my, where my isness contradicts my oughtness, I'm going to let my oughtness win. Because I'm is mad at you, but I ought to take care of you. I am is frustrated with you, but I ought to make sure that your, your well-being is intact. And there's a whole study of that, the whole study of that, right? When, when, when we look at the phrase from, from Christ on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that was a part of deontology. That's not something that, that he just... Uh, 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 that he just wanted to do, but that was he was accountable for the role he was playing at the time as savior, as redeemer, as the one that was purchasing us, right? So the ontology says that his isness was trumped by his oughtness, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see his isness, for isness that where he was, right? Father, if, if there's any other way, let this cup, what, pass from me. Right? Good. But then oughtness kicked in. But nevertheless, not my will, but, but thy will be done. His oughtness trumped his isness. He was accountable to what he ought to do. And what, when he was accountable to what he ought to do, what he ought to do helped him become who he really was supposed to be in the earth. See, this accountability thing we're talking about these couple of days is so very important. Because unless we confront this entitlement spirit, this entitlement mindset, this entitlement mentality, right? 
Then I know that spirit was a little churchy. But nonetheless, you know what I'm talking about. Unless we confront that, we're going to have a messed up generation of kids, grandkids, great grandkids, that's going to tear up everything that we leave them. We've got to teach them about accountability. Absolutely. Listen, that's my centering moment for this morning. This is the Culture Call with Elspeth Smith right here on Praise 93.3. Go ahead and get refreshed. Get you some more coffee. We've got a whole lot to talk about today in this whole subject of accountability. Don't miss it. This is the world back culture call that's right we are here with l spencer smith praise 93.3 fm and we are having an amazing conversation on this morning listen want to remind you go ahead and download that app and send me a chat that's right send me a chat i look forward to it or definitely you can call in 205-752-4800 that's 205-752-4800 we want you to hear from you you make the call um and you, you make the show rather so vibrant when you call us right and so yeah we want you to do that uh i'm telling you uh this conversation about accountability has stirred up a whole lot of folks and i love it i love it that's kind of what i live for is stirring up folks you know to get them to understand and to start thinking about this whole concept oh am i an accountable person D- it does my life function in a system of accountability or or am I entitled? Am I a person that just sees, you know, other people and, and, and what they should be doing for me? A- am I the kind of person uh, that, that, you know, weighs the value of people in my life based upon what they can give me, how much they can give me, and how expensive, you know, the things that they give me? Or am I an individual that says, you know what, I'm going to put my best me forward? I'm going to be vulnerable to every moment that I that I be accountable to what I know I can do. I'm never going to give you any less because you can't, one, afford me or you're not this kind of person or that kind of person. No, I'm going to do my best, whether you recognize me or not. You know, I, I, see, we have to decide on what kind of people we want to be. We have to decide today, Culture Call. I'm telling you today. Uh, that that I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to be studying, going to school and acting ignorant and only giving half or part of myself until they, you know, wherever I go can afford me. But let me say this already. Let me put this on. Go, go ahead. Put this out there. That there is nobody that really can afford you. You know, you, you just you're just so fearfully and wonderfully made. You're so brilliant. You, you know that 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 you've been so crafted by God in such a way that nobody really can afford you so far as affording goes, right? But what needs to be understood is regardless if they can afford you or not, are you accountable to what God has given you or what has been invested in you from an academic, a spiritual, inspirational, influential perspective that you give and you release all that you are supposed to release Believing that somewhere in the future, you know, and that future is qualitative, right? It could be a quantitative, right? It it, it could be next week, could be next year, could be five years from now that you're going to reap that. But I'm still going to give it, right? Part of what I part of part of what I understand is is that there are some places that my journey will lead me that I'm accountable to go, where that individual or that church or that that platform that stage those people cannot return to me they can't they can't give me anything you know for years when i started preaching i went out and teaching i started going and i would pour out my whole self i mean sweat do all that and that place could only afford to give me a, a small amount of money you know and they will say it i mean we do, we we say it now you know tongue in cheekly you know, I I can't pay you, but here's a token, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I ain't around. I can't ride the bus. But I was gracious because, you know, some places did the best they could. Some places I knew robbed me. But that did not stop. The robbing me or the lesser amount did not stop me from fulfilling my obligation and being accountable to what I know my assignment was. See? 
if I was entitled, now hear me now, I don't believe that we should just disrespect and dishonor people. I don't believe that. In a relationship, on the job, you know, in friendship, anywhere we go, I think that we ought to have a life of honor. I think that's how we ought to live. I think that's how we ought to lead with lives that of honor, right? That not only do I deserve to be honored, but I will give honor as a seed, as as a as a natural, you know, a natural uh, 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 motion to somebody else. If I'm at a big church, I'm at a little church. If I'm on a big platform or a little platform, if I'm on a, on a, a talking to a group of leaders or talking to people who are just trying to find out information to make themselves better. Right. Whether I am talking to people who are academically intellectual or whether I am talking to people who just are still trying to find the light switch in the dark. I'm going to give a thousand percent of who I am because I am not obligated about how they treat me. I'm not obligated in terms of what they give to me. I am accountable to what I have to give to what I bring to the table. I'm not going to deny myself because they didn't pick me up in a black suburban with tinted rental windows. They didn't pick me up in a in a in a in a, in a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes or in a in a uh, in a limousine. You know, now all of that has happened before, but that was further down the road. But that wasn't a caveat. That's not something that I said you got to do. Because if they had picked me up in a Toyota with a baby seat in the back, with some with with with, with some a snicker paper, some kiss paper on the bottom on the back seat, and they picked me up, guess what? Then, uh, yeah, I've I've ridden, gone to places, and folks were picking up their kids from school, and I rode to my hotel or rode to the church with them and their kids. Because guess what? That's the best that they could do. But my accountability was to me and what my assignment was. And that's what I want to really push into our community, push into our generation, and push into my listeners who are listening to the Culture Call this morning, that you are not obligated to do anything uh, uh, you know, or lessen yourself or decrease based upon what people may and or may not be able to return back to you. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, I know when people are taking advantage of me. Okay, comma. I know when people just want what I have and they don't intend to treat me right. I know it from the jump. I've been doing this long enough in any sphere, in a friendship, in a relationship, in church membership, in leadership, in music industry. I can tell when I meet you, I can tell in the conversation what your agenda is. But what I cannot allow that to do, what I know cannot afflict my soul, cannot afflict my mind, and cannot afflict my ability such that I lessen myself and give you on it. Because guess what? I don't know who is in that audience. I don't know who is looking at me. Come on, culture call. This is not preaching. I'm just trying to help you. I don't know who whose eyes are on me to see how I'm going to respond and react in this places. There are places, times that I have uh, I have done what I do in a storefront. There are a small place with just a few people, but in that place were people who had platforms, people who had uh, a certain levels of priority, uh, people who were known, who connected me to bigger places. See, that was reaping. That was the, I sold the seed. There was like, yo, if you do, you do this all the time. Yes. Yes, because that's my. I'm accountable. I'm accountable to what has been given to me, right? You know, I could have this uh, entitled situation. Listen, I've been doing this for sex, so, such and so years, and you know, I'm not moving. But I, no, 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 no. I do require honor be shown. I do require that. But guess what? And and when I say honor, I'm talking about honorarium. <laughs> I'm, I do require that, but we can negotiate. But when I land on the plane, when I land on the city, or if I show up, don't dishonor me. Don't act like you didn't know I was coming. Now, that I won't tolerate because now what you are going to do, you may not like me, but you're going to respect me, especially if you ask me to come, especially if I'm coming to give a service to you. Now, respect is, is a non-negotiable. Let me say that again. Respect is a non-negotiable. Right now, you're going to respect me now. That's you're going to have to do it. Absolutely. We're not going to play that kind of games. But 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 me giving the best of who I am, 
I, I, I have that obligation. I have that obligation. You see, so many people are having this conversation about, you know, in relationships, especially marital relationships, this generation, you know, um, uh, can we go 50-50? Or I think the man ought to do this. Or I think the woman ought to do that. And I think, and, and, and nobody's giving love. Everybody's got a big wall up. Everybody's telling each other what they think they should be doing. But what are you doing? Are you, uh, come on, come on, c- come closer. Lean up to it. Don't, don't back away yet. Don't back away. Are you, are you willing to give what you say you want to receive? Are you willing to be that kind of partner, right, in the relationship? Because that's what you, that's what you require. You mean, it, 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 see, see, there's going to be days, that 50-50 conversation is absolutely patently, ridiculously false in notion and in context. Because there are going to be days when you're in a relationship where that other person might be in a place where they can literally give nothing. That life has dealt them a hand that they cannot give you anything. And you're going to have to put up a 100% of everything. Is that a deal breaker for you? Then you don't ever need to be in a relationship. Eh, now. <laughs> Coach, your call. That's right. Tell them. Text them and say you don't never be in a relationship. You don't no. If 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 that person always has to be providing, even if you say fifty fifty, what happens if they lose their job? What happens if they cut back? What if happens if they de- demoted? What happens if that build that, that that business shuts down and they no longer have a job? Guess what you're gonna have to do if y'all gonna live. If you're gonna make it, then one person is gonna have to do a hundred percent for a season. And if that is a deal breaker for you then don't get up lying in church or in the park or in some fancy venue with these wedding dresses and these tuxedos on, talking about for better, for worse, for rich, for poor, in sickness and health, forsaking all others as long as you both shall live. Shut it down. No. Because you don't mean that at all. Because there are going to be days. Yes, there are going to be days. I remember when my wife's father's pa- father passed. We had just gotten married, and my wife's father passed, and it crushed her. It crushed her, and all she could do sometimes would just uh, 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 at night is just cry. She would go to work crying, come home crying, you know, be around crying. It was just it was just that kind of moment because she just lost the greatest man in her life, and I understood that. Sometimes all I could do was just hold her and let her cry. Rub her back in the bed and just let her cry. Now, I wouldn't expect her to be obligated to fulfill any conjugal duties. I wouldn't pinch her on the tail, tell her, well, I know you grieving your dad, but give me, I wasn't doing all of that. Come on, y'all. No, I had to bear the brunt and the load of the relational obligation. Guess what? Because as her husband, I was accountable to do that. That was a part of my accountability. That was a part of the vow that I made. Absolutely. She couldn't do it. There was nothing in her that had that on the mind. That wasn't grounds for divorce. That wasn't grounds to go out and get somebody else. No. That was grounds for me to take up 100% of the emotional context of our relationship until until she met wholeness, until she got healed, or until she got herself together. That was my obligation to her. Right. See, when you are entitled, see, I don't like the narrative that's coming out of this generation. It's killing. It's killing. It. It's killing. It's killing relationships. It's killing employment. It's killing church. It's killing sororities. It's killing fraternity. You name it, it's killing it. Because there's this whole entitlement thing of what you expect somebody else to do. I'm not saying expectation is wrong. I'm not saying, you know, believing that something is going to come back to you. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying that in a relationship you not you should not have some kind of, of caveats that something is going to come to you. I'm not asking you to babysit a man. I'm not asking you to babysit a woman. That's not what we're talking about. But I am saying... That accountability says that there might be seasons where I have to pull the entire load. Accountability says I might have to do this for a season by myself with them in tow. That's what it is. That's what accountability is. 
And we can try to deny that all we want to, but we're never going to have lasting relationships. Never. Absolutely. You got to be a, be accountable to show up. You got to be accountable to give your best. You got to be accountable to show yourself friendly if you require friends. You got to be accountable to keep a secret when somebody is putting their trust in you. You have to be trustworthy because that's a part of accountability. You got to be a person of character and integrity. You know why? Because that is a part of accountability. That's what it is. And if you cannot rise to that measure, if you cannot rise to that measure of accountability, then don't establish relationships. Because you are faulty. You are the faulty one in the mix. Let me say this again, that you are indeed the faulty one in the mix, right? Let people go on by themselves before you get involved with your entitled self and bring nothing to the table but make all of these obligations because you saw somebody on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever other kind of thing they got out now. And you're looking and you're trying to live vicariously their life. You're trying to live this life through them that you know that the per the listen, that man works as a janitor at in the school system at Mercedes. He's not gonna be able right now to buy you no BMW or no Mercedes. And guess what? If you love him, you are accountable to no matter. And I don't care if you are a CEO. I don't care if you are a supervisor, if you are the principal, if you are the lead teacher. No. If you made a, uh, an obligation or you made a vow to this individual to love them and to be there for them, then we pool our money together. Don't you lord over him or don't you lord over her because they're not making what you think they ought to be making or they're not giving you Louis and Gucci and, and Christian Louboutin and they're not taking you on exotic vacations to Hawaii and Greece and Jamaica because they can't do that right now. Right? You no, no, your obligation, your prime obligation is to be accountable to the relationship and the vow that you made. That's what it means to be in relationship. That's what it means to be an adult. That's what it means to be matured. That's what it means to understand who you are and what you bring to the table. Do you understand, listen, that each and every one of us are so powerful that in relationships, we're literally able to carry another individual that there, that we, that already inside of us, God put it on the inside of us that we have because we are made in his image and his likeness. You know, he has carried all of humanity. He carried us, right? And we have the same ability to carry our wives, carry our children until Another season comes because guess what? One day they may have to carry you. It's all about understanding the weight you can carry and be accountable to that. Will they get back to you? I don't know. I do not know if that person can literally get back to you. But we make those decisions before we even get into and invest in that relationship. That is understanding the weight of accountability, especially in relationships. Y'all hearing me, Culture Call? I know you are. Absolutely. Listen, this is indeed the Culture Call, and we are fire hot today, and I'm excited. Hit me up on the chat. Go ahead and get your number. Get you something to drink. Get you some eat. Should be time for breakfast, maybe brunch or whatever. And listen, I need you to keep it right here. Got so much more to come. This is the world are back. It's the top of the hour, 11 a.m. and some change right here on the Culture Call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith on Praise 93.3 FM. And all morning, we have been blazing. That's right. We've been in a hot topic this morning talking about accountability. I'm telling you, what a necessary and needed account uh, needed a conversation for our generation. And I hope that you're paying attention, Culture Call, because I'm telling you, a whole lot of stuff is being said all on this morning preparing us i think it's preparing us to have better relationships and to have a better community because once we understand what we are accountable to do in every relationship i think that it makes us better don't you 
Yeah, I think it makes us better. Listen, listen, I got a couple of, again, uh, a community announcement from the Impact Nation. That's right. That's my church. Uh, we're having on August 18th. Go ahead and mark it on your calendar. It's a Friday. We're having our sacred singles gathering. Absolutely. It is going to be the bomb.com. That's right. It's going to be wonderful having, you know, having a, a, a soiree. We're going to be imparting and instructing. Our theme this year is called Boundaries, you know, learning how to protect yourself in these relationship streets. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yes. And so we want you, you and most certainly you to come. All single people, all single people, you need to be there. That's right. You need to be at Sacred this year. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. You can look at the Impact Nation Fellowship Church Instagram or and or uh, 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 Facebook page and find up more information there. And we'll definitely make sure that you are a part of the uh, of the gathering. Right. We have VIP and uh, there's a few there's a few left. So you need to go ahead and get that. But go ahead and do that. Uh, you can register at bit.ly backslash sacred. 2023. That's bit.ly backslash sacred 2023. And we look forward to seeing you there. So much, so much going on in our community. And yes, I need you to go ahead and send me up, you know, your, uh, your, your announcements, public service announcements, culture call dot praise at gmail.com. That's culture call dot praise at gmail.com. And we will most certainly let everybody know what's happening in your neck of the woods so that they can come and participate and make your event great. Hey, good. Yeah, that's what I need you to do. I need you to go ahead and make sure that you send that to me. All right. Listen, I've been looking at this chat <laughs> this morning and y'all feel some type of way about this conversation. And I like this one because I don't I don't say everything on this chat on the air. But here is one I thought was important. And a person said D from Tuscaloosa said, uh, honestly, a lot of people are fighting not against entitlement, but to be the most entitled purpose in the uh, entitled person in the situation. Wowzer, wowzer. So they don't have no problem with entitlement. Yeah, they don't have an issue, rather. They're not fighting against entitlement. They're just trying to see who can be the most entitled per person in the relationship. They can't, you know, now that is, and I'm going to use a word from the culture, that is the definition of a toxic individual, that you want to be the most entitled person. You want to be the the one that that's, that that receives most of the time. You want to make sure that you're able to control the relationships by your desires, spoken and or unspoken desire. That that person ought to be a, a mind reader and, and, and they ought to be able to give you and be not only ought to be able to, but mandated to give you, you know, what you feel entitled that you need in order to be. You know, I, I'm, I, reading this chat, I immediately begin to think about, listen, I really begin to think about what do we think, what, what do you feel that you in really entitled to. I mean, what's the root of that? What is the what is the root of that? I mean, you know, is it that, you know, you feel like somebody ought to give you something, you know, just for breathing? That somebody ought to be obligated to you just for showing up in a, with a, a nice suit, you know, or whatever. I don't know. Where does that come from? Is that borderline narcissistic? I think it is. Is that is that um, it's all about me? That when you look in the mirror, you should see me. When you look in your dreams, you should, see, should be, uh, see me. That I should be the vision of the context of your life, right? That when you get your check, that check should have, you should endorse that check to me and my desires. Is that what that really is? Because what it's doing, it is crushing and crumbling the foundation of relationships because it takes out the measure of accountability that, that, that not just accountability, but the mutuality of relationship. That we are in this together, that we are in this in a partnership, that we are in this in a part and parcel to make sure what that whatever project and or assignment goes forth flawlessly, that I'm bringing the best of who I am. And I the, the, the only thing that I should expect is you to bring the best of who you are, if you can do it right I think that's I think that's the measure we need to begin to to really really nail down and not just pontificate on 
definitions and let people slide and slip by, you know, but using these old definitions. And again, because they're selling mics and they got, you know, everybody can be on, can have a TV show on YouTube channel. You can have, everybody can, got something they want to say. It doesn't mean just because, just because they're saying it doesn't mean that it's right. Doesn't mean that, mean that it makes sense. You know, to some folks, I may not make sense. And you're definitely, you know, you have that right to have that kind of perspective. I can't, I can't change it, but I'm accountable to, to educate. I'm accountable to study. I'm accountable to investigate and give you the best truth that I can give you that applies to all of our lives so that we can build, you know, a, a, a healthy black community. Not only that, but that we can cultivate leaders within the context of that community. Right. But, but, but definitely, you know, I, I'm appreciative. Do I have a national name? Absolutely. Have I traveled the length and breadth of this country? Absolutely, I have. Right? But do I feel uh, do I feel uh, entitled to have you listen to me every day? It's a blessing. It's a privilege. It's an honor that you will listen to me on this radio show every day. Absolutely. Do I expect you to come to be part of my church because you listen to me on the radio? No, absolutely not. Because you got places that you have been assigned that you must be accountable to that place. See? See, it's it's all how you view your life. I am an asset. And it's a shame that now some people might think, well, you know, I'll send out this this rumor, this trope that, you know, he's not approachable. This is that X, Y, Z. You know? Yeah. No, that's not true. You know, because people create narratives because of their own deficiencies. That's not my responsibility. Neither am I accountable to live or not live that. I'm just accountable to be who I am, just like you are accountable to be who you are. If everybody's talking bad about you and doing a rumor about you, you're not accountable to live your life to be the uh, to be the active contradiction to that rumor in terms of finding the rumor and living against it, or living according to, or, or, or living to anti that rumor. No, just be who God has made you to be. Just be how you, you know, just be what you know you be and give the best of who you are and let everybody else figure out what they want to do. That's accountability. That is accountability. I'm accountable to people. And people are accountable to me. And there is nothing wrong with that. Right? Now, when you make an investment in a corporate situation, for example, if I put money in the bank, I am entitled to get my money out. Not everybody's money. You see, I'm not, no, no, no. That's why the, your bank, your, your, your institution of savings has an FDIC, you know, insured. That, 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 right. That, that your money is insured. That if something happens in the market, that your money is insured. That the people have to give you back your money up until a certain amount of money, right? Up until a certain degree and a certain amount. So once you make a certain amount of money, the bank says, yo, don't put millions over here because we're not going to be accountable for all those millions. That's why you folks find investments and all those different kinds of things, right? But but that they have an FDIC insured or every when you enter the bank you'll see it because and they are accountable to you for what you put in. You can't put in five thousand dollars and then you come back next week and they say, "Oh, we lost your money. Sorry, here's a toaster." No, that's not how. No, they have to be accountable to you. They're in the business of accountability. They're insured up to that. Right. When people meet you, you should ensure them that you're going to be accountable to being who you are and giving what you have been designing to give. That I'm not going to go a place and you shouldn't go a place and give a part of yourself or be lackluster or give only 50 percent or 25 percent of yourself because somebody in the audience you don't like or they have something. in the, Absolutely not. No, you have to be accountable to being who you ought to be. And that comes in with this word that we talked about earlier called deontology. That's right. Deontology. Deon, D-E-O-N, tology, T-O-L-O-G-Y. It is the study of duty and obligation and responsibility. Now, did you know that was even a study? Right. That you have to study. There's a study that looks at duty, people's duties, responsibility and obligations that they, they look at. It's a study about accountability to effort and energy and direction and intentionality. It is really the balance of how you weigh your isness with your oughtness, because a lot of times 
are what we is, you know, let me just use this English for just a minute. What we is doing is different than what we ought to do. What I am doing is different than I what I ought to be doing. What I and how I am living is different than how I ought to live. And those two normally do in the area of accountability. They duel in the area of character and integrity. They fight each other in the human will and conscience because this is what I'm doing, but I ought to be doing more. But because I have done this or because I'm not getting what I think I should get, I'm just going to give them a little bit of this. Right? I'm going to give them a little bit of my energy, a little bit of my genius, a little bit of myself, you know, because... I'm going to give on the level that I believe that these people should receive. No, I'm no. Artness says, I'm going to give it all. I'm going to give everything I got, whether it's five people, whether these people and three of them don't like me, but they got to attend. I'm going to give them. Uh, Cause guess what? Uh, if, if, if you somebody like me, I'm really going to give it to them. Why? <laughs> because I want those three to understand that how they feel and what they think about me does not matter in the light of who I am and what I am capable of doing. I am accountable to me. I'm accountable to the impartation and the investments that have been made into me to give them a hundred, a thousand percent of who I am, regardless of how they feel about me, because me doing so might, might change their mind. I don't know. But that's not my obligation. That's not my responsibility. Right? So deontology is the study of, you know, you know somebody who's doing something and you look at them, yeah, but they really could be doing better. Or or you sit, you, you're listening to them and you're like, yeah, but that ain't what they ought to be doing because they can really do much more. There's a whole study dedicated to that. There's a whole study dedicated to that. It's it's almost like the the the, the study of deontology is you could sum it up if you using the text, the Bible, it like the, the Bible say, <laughs> right? It's the it's the parable of the talents that the, the that 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 person, that man, that Lord gave those guys five talents, two talents, one talent. That's a study in deontology, a study of duty, responsibility, and obligation, and you can look at it. You can look at each each level, right? The one that had five did what they were supposed to do, did their obligation, and they made ten. Uh, The one that was two, they they, they did their obligation, and they made four. The one that had one, and it's always always the, the ones who have the least level of responsibility that fall behind in accountability and obligation, right? And you know the end of the text. They didn't produce. They didn't manifest anything. They hid it in the ground. And the and the master said, you are a wicked and unprofitable servant. That means you are twisted. Wicked means twisted. Not necessarily evil, but twisted in your mind, like wicker chair, like the wicker. Yeah, wicked in your mind, twisted in your mind, perverted in your mind, and you're unprofitable. That means you don't you you're not giving me back anything. You're not you were responsible for making the increase cuz I told you at the beginning occupy till I come. That word occupy means to do business. That means to get to work, make an exchange, you know, use my investment and create something. And I gave you everything you needed, right? According to your own ability. I wasn't measuring by you by anybody else. I wasn't grading you off of anybody else's test scores. I did, this was not put on a curve. I was giving you, I gave you something uh, according to the ability that I knew you could do it. You just were not accountable to your ability. You were not accountable to the delay of time and the opportunity because sometimes the 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 the, the blessing or or the, the 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 delay is really is really working for our behalf. It's really development. You did nothing with it, right? And deontology said what he what he thought or uh, his isness conflicted with his oughtness and his isness blamed everything on the type of man that the investor was. I knew you were a hard man. I knew you were mean and I knew you were going to do X, Y, Z, X, A, B, C. So therefore, right, because one thing, uh, uh, one thing entitlement does, 
is it loves to cast blame on somebody else and what they are not doing. Yeah, lean in a little closer. Don't turn me off now. Listen up. That's exactly what it loves to do. It loves to blame somebody else for what is going on or what did not place take place in their lives. Right? I'm this way because this person didn't love me. I'm this way because this happened. I'm this way because X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Right? And when you have individuals like that, when you have individuals like that, then you blame other people for it. Right? You could have had bad parents. Hey, guess what? You are now 30 years old. You going to blame it on them? Or did you have enough time to develop yourself out of the dysfunctional cycles and, and, and habits that you learned? Did you have enough time to fix it, to fix you? You are accountable to you. At some given age, at, at some given point, that your parents are no longer accountable for you. And I know there are people that may uh, disagree with me, but, uh, but you know, L is still her bishop is still hurt. Okay, I get it. But what is your accountability to yourself? Culture call. Let's call it to the carpet. What is our accountability to ourselves? You going to blame them forever? Guess what? Some of them are deceased, dead and gone. You still mad at the teacher because they didn't stay after class with you? You still upset because they bullied you in the second grade? You got two degrees now. You on your way to your doctorate and you still mad? Come on, y'all. At some given point, we've got to be accountable for our own selves. Right? We've got to be accountable. See, when you come from dysfunction, yes, when you come from dysfunction and all of that, it begins to call, it begins to call into, into, into understanding, you know, hey, what's, what, what, what's my responsibility here? And where are we going with this context? And what, what do I do to fix this? Is, am I going to allow my children to be like this simply because of what I went through? Absolutely not. Listen, so I, I need y'all to talk to me about it. I want to give you a space to talk. I believe I got a caller on the line. Let me see what's happening right here. Uh, let me see how I do this. Hey, this is the culture call. Who, who do I have? This is Annie Petty calling. <laughs> hey, Annie, how are you? Fine. How are you? I'm doing well. If you could do me a favor, if you could turn down your radio a little bit because we're getting a little echo, just turn your radio. There you go. There you go. Now, what you, what, what, what you got to say on this subject today? Yeah. Uh, we black folks uh-huh. are the slackers because uh, preachers should teach parents, teach the congregation about the responsibility of our children. Yeah. We, um, uh, Reverend John A. Cherry, mm-hmm. I heard him speaking, and he was saying that uh, a parent, a person who has a baby, uh-huh. would at least plan to take care of that person until he's 21. Uh-huh. Right. We should stand in there and do what we need to do and not uh, put it on somebody else. Exactly. And the other thing he was saying that, you know what? Uh, we are the worst ones for doing that. We don't take care of our kids. We leave them for somebody else to take care of them. And we need to be responsible. Wow. That's right, Miss Annie. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you so much for calling in and giving me your perspective. Thank you so much, dear. Listen, and Miss Annie is absolutely correct that we have this thing. See, again, again, we have this thing in our community about trying to toughen up our children and not giving them adequate love not giving them adequate care, not giving them adequate impartation, not give, no, not, not giving them adequate protection because we are so busy trying to get people, trying to get our children to grow up so fast that we don't do what we need to do, but we are accountable for making sure our children are taken care of. Listen, I believe I got another caller and hey, this is the culture call. How are you? Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Who do I have on the line? This is Mrs. Joyce Low Stewart in Crescent East Park. Hey, Miss Joyce, been missing you. How you been doing? I've been I've been calling, but I had you know the phone been ringing and I couldn't get through. Okay, but I'm calling you today. 
Uh-huh. To let you know. Yes, ma'am. The Holy Spirit have revealed to me mm-hmm. and showed me mm-hmm. what he have empowered and put in you. Oh, and it's you. greatness. Thank you. And it's blessing. Thank you. And you got a beautiful, wonderful heart in you. Thank you so much. You got a pure heart. And you a people person. You love people. And you don't mean no harm to nobody. None. You trying to teach and educate and learn black people what they need to know. And I thank you and I appreciate it. And I want you to know I am accountable for my ways and action. That's right. And I try to love people, treat people right, do right by people, and I'm a giver. Awesome. I'm a giver, and I give and share my money and whatever I have, my blessing with people that's in need. I love it. I was raised that way. I was yes, taught man. that way, and I've been that way all my life. Awesome. And it don't hurt you. And it don't hurt you. It's a blessing to you. Absolutely. Thank you so and much. And you be blessed, my friend, and I want you to know <laughs> I was praying for you in your hour of bereavement. Thank you so much. You so and kind. I love you. And you talking about your mother and father and your children yes. and your wife. That's an inspiration, a blessing to me. Oh, to bless let you. me know it's still good people, blessed people trying to live right down here on this earth. Yes, ma'am. And you be blessed today. You too, Miss Joyce. God bless you. Okay. Thank you so Bye-bye. much, darling. Thank you, honey. Listen, I needed that little shot in my arm. Thank you, Miss Joyce, for encouraging me. That's what it is. That's right. Tell the people. Because, you know, there are narratives out that he's mean. I'm not. No, I just mean what I say. And, uh, you know, and my job, my assignment every day is to empower my people, empower my community, just like my parents taught me to do. That's what my mom and dad, my grandparents taught me to, if you can't build up the community, definitely don't hurt the community. And so I use my voice, not just on the pulpit. Uh, yeah, but I use it here at the radio station to make sure that our people are, are never late, last, and lost, but we are being the best that we can possibly be. Listen, we have, that's my accountability. That's what I'm accountable for. That's right. That is what my assignment is. And see, here's the deal. I think when we begin to talk about all of the things that go on uh, uh, in, in our lives, we've got to stop making excuses. We've got to stop making excuses to for, for, for the things that don't work for us. We've got an obligation and must be accountable to ourselves. Listen, this person in the chat says a lot of people improperly assign what they receive from a parental relationship and try to apply that to their romantic relationship. That's good. Folks think that w- that what their father or mother did for them should be done by their spouse or significant other, but miss the relational dynamic between their parents because what a husband and wife deals with from each other is different than what a child sees from their parent dynamic. That is powerful. Oh, wow, I just missed the call. But no problem. Call back. Listen, I agree with this person because sometimes we hold uh, we hold people accountable that have absolutely nothing to do with our family dynamic, right? Nothing to do. All right, let me get this call up real quick. Hey, hey, you're online. This is the Culture Call. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Who do I have with me this morning? My name is Crystal Brown. I was calling because I was listening on the conversation. As a young parent, I feel like one of the mistakes we make is trying to be our children's friend other than directing them and teaching them. We have to, because we are in what we call different times or different generations, don't mean the Bible is wrong. We still have to raise our children the way the Bible instructs us to. So I feel like people in my age, 20s and 30s as parents or teen parents, don't be your child's friends. Be that example that they need. Be in their lives. Don't club hop. Spend time with your children because that's our that's, responsibility. That's right. That's right, Crystal. Thank you so much for your insight, darling. Thank you. I appreciate it. Listen, what Crystal just said is right. That if you had a child when you're young in your teenage years or your early 20s, right, your obligation is not to be that child's friend. No, let me say that. That when you when a child comes into the earth, that your job now switches to a parent. They have to earn friendship and they earn friendship by following you uh, and and being accountable to what you teach them. So you have to teach them. You have to be responsible for them. Absolutely. That we have entitled children because they know that if they get in trouble at school, their friend masquerading as their parent is going to come and defend them. They're going to come and listen, I'm not by all means saying Teachers are right. 
all the time. I was a teacher. There were some times that I did things that were not right. But what I required my parents to do, if they needed to talk to me about something I did wrong, we would never discuss that in front of the child. Oh, absolutely not. Because, you know, I'm of the generation that children need to stay in a child's place. Hello, somebody. Do you understand what I'm saying? That my job is not to be your friend. Friendship is earned. And yeah, and, and the more I can trust you and the more you can be responsible and the more that you can be accountable with the measure of that friendship, then we'll morph into that. You see, that that my mother and my father, they we grew up, I grew up, you know, as the parents. And I, I you know, when they got in their 60s, maybe, <laughs> that thing switched, right? That thing switched, and I was on the I was on the edge of my forties, you know, in my late thirties, forties, when that thing switched, where we became more friends. But I never lost the aspect that those were my parents, that I was accountable to them as a son. I was. Let me say it again. I was accountable to them as a son. Right. See, we, we got this kind of generation that feels like when you grow up that you can just handle folks any kind of way, handle your parents, same thing, use profanity, cuss around it. No, the issue is honor. You are accountable for honoring your father and your mother. That is the first commandment with promise that it will go well with you, that their days may be long upon the land. There is something about being accountable to honoring your that parental relationship. But going back to this person who did in the chat, you, because you had a good mama and a daddy and they provided for you, your daddy did this and your mama did that, and you see them do that for each other. When you get in a relationship, you cannot hold somebody else accountable to treating your, you like you saw your mom and your dad treat each other. You know why? Because that's two different bloodlines. That person is coming from a different environment. That's why with in love, you must be accountable to first have a conversation before you have coitus, which is lovemaking. See, that you should have sex with anybody that you've not had a conversation of accountability. Because that man, that woman is not your mama and that man is not your daddy. Absolutely. And so trying to put that, and you need to talk about it because you don't know where they come from. They may have never seen that level of functionality. And you're holding them accountable to something that they've never realized. So that's, you have, you cure that not by sleeping with each other. You cure that not by coming to the altar to Don, Don, to Don with white dresses and tuxedos on. You cure that by a conversation of accountability. How are we going to make this work for us? What is your perspective on this? What is your perspective on that? And I think that when we do that, when we have those conversations of accountability, our relationships will turn out much better. Listen, got more to go. This is the Culture Call with L. Spencer Smith right here on Praise 93.3. Listen, we're having a wonderful conversation about accountability and building healthy relationships. So much more to talk about. Keep it right here. Be right back. This is the world And family, we are back right here on the Culture Call with L. Spencer Smith. That's right. That's me on Praise 93.3 FM. And we are having an amazing day. Yeah, we're having a great day. A great day. Talking about accountability and building healthy relationships. And it's been a doozy. Don't you think? Yeah, it's been a doozy. I know it has been. It's been a doozy. And let me say this. And not only has it been a doozy, I think that we have really stimulated some level of conversation. And uh, I'm reading some of the chats that I'm getting. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to have to do this another day. I'm going to have to come back on Wednesday and talk a little bit more. Uh, because I'm looking at it because I want to answer your questions. One of these uh, questions says, sir, how do we posture ourselves away from trying to force people to be accountable? Now, now, now that's that's a heavy question. Because... What it what what the question is asking is how can I divorce myself away from the self imputed responsibility to make sure other people stay accountable? Here is the reality: people gonna people. That that that, that that's the revelation that people are going to do what they want to do. The question becomes: is that if they are in relationship, the conversation of mutuality, of what we expect. You know, uh, at at a certain age, at a certain age, if you're 12, it is, do you love me? I love you. Check in the box. Yes, so maybe so. At 16, it might be a little bit more than that. At 21, there is something else. You begin to, you know, you begin to 
de- to really develop uh, a, a complex feelings for an individual because now you're growing up. But at certain age points, the conversation of uh, of, of the intimate conversations change from you know wedding bells and all of this. The intimate conversation is. What are we mutually bringing to the table together? What are we mutually accountable for and obligated to do that will ensure the health and the wholeness of each other on this journey that we're trying to take together? See, the older you get, the more nuanced and specific the question becomes in terms of accountability and mutuality, right? That if if you can't have a conversation of mutuality, if you cannot have a conversation of obligation, if you can't have a conversation of deontology with this individual, yeah, then don't even waste your time, right? If if you're talking about building a family and they're talking about going to clubs and hopping and, and spending money on the, on material things, you automatically know that y'all not going the same direction. Come closer, come closer. The, 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 the text says, don't be unequally yoked with non-believers, Okay, now I understand there are several levels of theological contextuality that we can deal with regards to that statement, with regards to that text, right, that Paul puts in Corinthians. But here is what I want to bring out. I want to push that really hard, that any area of life, because I look for the universality of the text, I look to see how the text can be applied, not just to the the time and the culture in which he said it, but how can we apply that to our lives now? Now, most people say that be not unequally yoked with uh, non-believers. Talking, thinking we're talking about in a salvation, simply in a salvation context. If they don't believe in what you believe in terms of Christ and believes of of, of, of your relationship, then you cannot be yoked, right? Don't be yoked up together. And they, the the whole symbol, symbolism there is a yoke of oxen. That's that thing that you put on each other, the oxen. You put them two by two, and they put this yoke on their necks so that they can go in the same direction. That they won't be, uh, you know, you're moving and you're plowing a field together. That's the objective. So in other words, don't go on a journey of trying to grow something with someone that does not believe in 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 Jesus like you believe in Jesus in Christ your salvation right that's one aspect or that's one you know uh, uh exegetical understanding of that text but when you bring that into a universality don't be yoked up with people who don't believe what you believe and what you what they what you're defining as accountability and responsibility and mutuality in other areas of life in other words it's going to be very difficult to go in the same direction if you are a person that is accountable to your money and you got a person that doesn't care anything about financial stewardship. How are you going to be in a relationship with them? How are y'all going to go on a journey together? That, that you are a person that believes in, 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 you know, a person, a man don't work, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't eat. And this person's like, well, I don't really like jobs because it's too confining and I like to be a free spirit. How are you going to go with them? How y'all going somewhere together? See, this ain't got nothing to do with love. Cause, cause I love him, Bishop. I love him, L. Anybody care about you loving him and her? That ain't what this is about. We're talking about the journey. And I want to say this and put this on the record. Let the record show that love is not enough when y'all are fighting on the journey. When two people are not supposed to go on the same journey, they can still love each other, but we automatically know that this love, this thing right here, this stops right here. And I love you enough not to get yoked with you because I am going to be a thorn in your flesh if we get intimate. Facts. I am going to be someone that you, you're you not going to like. and I'm going to wake up in the morning and not like you. Not even wake up in the morning. I ain't going to sleep because <laughs> I'm going to be up all night trying to figure out how in the world... Did my life get connected to you? I'll tell you how. You ignored accountability. You ignored mutuality. You got yoked up with an individual that don't want, that does not want to be held accountable because your job in a relationship is not to be, unless you are a parent, your job is not to be someone else's parent. Unless you have had a child, your job is not to treat that other individual as a child. Yeah? Unless that person came out of your room, womb and out of your private place, and you made a baby together, that person is not some person some person that you have to put in a daycare center or you have to babysit. 
No, absolutely not. You are unequally yoked. And y'all could go to the same church, hearing the same preacher, got saved on the same day, got baptized in the same water. But guess what? He, they believe one thing of what the preacher said, and you believe another thing what the preacher said. And, 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 and those polar understandings are the reason why you cannot be with them. Don't be unequally yoked. Your responsibility is not to hold somebody else accountable because the suggestion there is, is that they cannot hold themselves accountable. That's why conversations of accountability and mutuality and obligation need to be had. That's intimate. That can be a very intimate kind of setting. That can be done over candlelight and fireplace. That can be done over roses. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, that can be a very intimate comment. Here's what I am, here's what I'm accountable for. Here's what I'm willing. I want to take this relationship a step further. Here is what I, and this is in romantic relationships. Here is what I, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm bringing to the table, right? And I need to hear from you what you, what your response is to what I'm bringing to the table. And when that thing feels right and at that connection, and we start talking about certain aspects that will come into life. If I if I had a good job and I lost my job, are you willing to handle this, handle the all of it for us and not leave me and not leave me because I'm down? Are you willing to bear the brunt of this relationship, of this marriage? If they say, I don't know if I can, listen, don't ignore yellow flags on your way to red flags. Huh? See, I'm going to be talking about that in our singles conference. Yeah, don't ignore yellow flags. Because, see, when they say that, I don't know if I can. Okay. Okay. Then watch your investment because automatically they're already telling you that I don't know if we're going to be able to have a lasting journey together. Because I don't know if something happened to you, if I'm going to be able to be faithful. I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle all this by myself. I don't know if I'm going to leave you or not. Nope, 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 nope. Don't be looking in your eyes, looking at them brown eyes, them green eyes. Don't be looking at them bow legs and that curly hair or whatever kind of hair you got, dreads, whatever you, you're you attracted to. No, go deeper and find out, do I need to be yoked up to this girl? Do I need to be yoked up to this guy? That's what I want to know. Right. Because if we're going to be in a relationship, it's, we got to be accountable to what we say we're going to do. Also, I think that as you're talking about, you know, how do we back up? You got to learn how see. Let me say this too. Let me say this. You are not a witch. You are not a manipulator. No. You put it out there. I expect you to be accountable just like I'm accountable. But holding you accountable, making sure that you are accountable, no. I, I got to make sure my kids pick up their clothes. I got to make sure that they do their homework. But I'm not going to be making sure that you do right by me in terms of just doing what you're supposed to be doing, obligated in this relationship. That's not my job. If it's not in you to treat me right, if it's not in you to be faithful, if it's not in you to be honorable and respectful and courteous, if it's not in you to do what you feel that's best for me, if it's not in you to carry this when the, in the, on the days that I cannot, if it's not in you to, to cover me, if it's not in you to intercede for me, if it's not in, if, if that ain't in you, then, you know, like, I, I'm trying to figure out what what's the name of these people. My, and my daddy raised, I, I don't think this is the Manhattans. Gerald Alston, I know that. It might be the Manhattans. And that, that the song says, let's just kiss and say goodbye. That's where we at right now. <laughs> when, when, they can, <laughs> when they can't figure out what they want to do. Yeah. Why are we wasting time? We can be f friends and, and we can talk about the other person you get. You know, and if they if they like it, listen. I'll you, if if they like what you bring to the table, and that that halfness that you're gonna bring, or that unsureness you're gonna bring, God bless you and yours. If you like it, like and not come on, that's our community. If you like it, I love it. But as for me and my house, I'm not gonna pull up with that. Nope, 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 nope. See, it's conversations, and we are afraid to have these conversations because it's the conversation that's gonna reveal the truth that y'all don't need to be together. Hello, somebody's. That's what, and so we don't like to have conversations. We like, we like to talk about, but you know, yeah, you look beautiful, you know, and you are handsome, and I can see me spending the rest of my life with you and want to have your little babies. Man, anybody got time for that? Ain't nobody got time for that. Right. You need to make sure that are you, cause you ain't gonna be able to, you're not gonna be able, here's where the force thing comes in. You're not gonna be able to spend time 
finding them, you're going to be at work. You can be handling your obligation. And, and you got to trust that they're going to be accountable to the relationship. You ain't got time to follow them around and, you know, after they clock off of work, be sitting outside their job. And you ain't got every time they go to the store, you trailing them in the car. You ain't got time to be hiring no private eyes. Grow up. No. No. Accountability is a mature science. Let me say that. Accountability is utilized to to measure maturity. And if they cannot be accountable, they don't need to be in a heavy relationship. They don't need to be working on a job. They don't need to be uh, uh, on your organization. They don't need to be on your leadership staff if they if you got to always hold them accountable to what they have been assigned to do or what they are obligated to do. Absolutely not. You don't have the time. Culture call. We don't have the energy to be doing that. And so many marriages and so many relationships break up because we don't have that conversation. That's a first date conversation. As, as a matter of fact, that's a let's go in the park. Listen, y'all talking about, well, he got to spend this and she got to go here. And I, no, no, no. I want to go to the park. I want to go someplace where we feel comfortable talking. Let's go to McDonald's and, and share some fries. And we each going to get a high seat armor to drink. I'm not going to make no major investments. I'm not going to take you to Paris and spend $200 on a, on a, on a, on a, on a fact finding mission. No, no, no. When I know that we're going to be accountable to each other, guess what I'm going to do? Then I'll lay out the red carpet and I'll open up the coffers. But no, until then, we're going to go and get a split a burger at Whataburger and we're going to talk about this conversation of accountability. Talk, L, I am. Yeah. You invest too much too fast and have no guarantee of accountability and then wonder why it don't work because you don't have the con- – your, your heart gets invested before your mind begins to talk about accountability and obligation. No, 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 absolutely not. Take your time and have the conversation. Say it right. Come on, say it with me. I must take my time and have the right conversations because you, they are not children. When you have children, you must make them accountable and you're growing them up. And then there's going to be days when you say, okay, what did I tell you to do? You're going to turn it loose because you're going to expect them to be accountable and fulfill their obligation as children. It's called chores. But in a relationship, you too old to be trying to do that. You are not in grade school. You are not in high school. You are an adult. And you need to be accountable and obligated to functioning with someone else who you can look up with as an adult. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all burning up this chat today, and I love it. <laughs> Listen, this is the Culture Code with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on Praise 93.3. We are having an, a time here today. Got a little bit more. Don't miss it. This is the world premiere. And we are back. Coach Call. I am telling you, we've had a doozy today. But guess what? We've come to the ending moments of this incredible show on accountability, accountability and building healthy relationships. You know what? I might just do a little bit more of this on tomorrow. Yeah. I might do just a little bit more on this because I think it's a healthy conversation and y'all are blowing up this chat. <laughs> yes, you all are blowing up this chat. And I think that we need to have more conversations just like this. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, I think we need to understand. I want to put more meat on the bones of what I was talking about being unequally yoked because I think that is a part of the, the, uh, uh, the accountability conversation because I don't think that it is an aspect of of, of, re, of relationships that we think about, that we don't think about being equally yoked or going in the same direction with the individual. If both of y'all dysfunctional, you know, you ever seen two dysfunctional people, they get together and it works, but then you see few people who you think are Christian, who are believers, and it just doesn't work. Some things just don't work. Folks, some things just don't work. And the reality of it is, is that they should have never been together in the first beginning. <laughs> they should never have been together because their belief systems, although they believe in Christ, their belief systems, their systems of belief, they believe in Christ, but their belief systems are different in how they see it. Because you can believe in Christ and he comes from a strand where he does, he thinks the wife ought to be the keeper of the home. She ought to be silent and all this and be dutiful. And you come from the strand of empowerment, of equality. There's no Jew, no Greek, no male, male, no female, no bond, no free. And you want to do all of the agency that God has given you. Yeah, that ain't going to work. 
is not going to work on these streets called relationships. Yeah. And so there are things that we are obligated to do in every sphere of relationships on our workplace, at our church. And I think I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, at our workplace, at our church, in a marital relationship as parents, as one of our callers brought in today, we have certain levels of accountability and obligation in each of those places. They are not all the same level. We don't have the same, uh, uh, there's not the same level of intensity uh, and obligation in each one because those are different character dynamics that you got to begin to look at and face when you're trying to establish a relationship and causing it to grow. You're accountable in other, in, and not just in other areas, but in different ways. I'm not accountable to my children like I'm accountable to my wife because there's a different level of accountability. You see what I'm saying? But listen, my time has run out, but we have had a blast today. Shout out to all my callers. Shout out to all of you all that have hit me on the chat. Shout out to all of you who have been listening to me today. It's been awesome as we've been talking about accountability. But listen, we've come to the end of another great, great show. And as my grandmama and my mama would say at the end of every phone call, I love you a bushel. I love you a peck. And I love you a hug around the neck until tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're going to be right here on the Culture Call with L. Spencer Smith. Praise 93.3 FM. Until then, though, you have a great day. Be kind to someone. Make an impact in the world and do good. God bless. Peace.